church family. During the summertime, sometimes our family gets small. And uh, that's the way it is uh, this particular Sabbath day. Uh, a lot of people are vacationing with their kids. A lot of them are just uh, vacationing. Uh, and we like sometimes when we get a lot of a lot of visitors, but sometimes we don't get to during the summer. But I want to say welcome to you ever so much for being here. Uh, and I give a joke sometimes. I say, you know, the pastor is away. And some people will say, oh, the pastor's away. I don't need to go. And I say, no, that's when you need to go. The church needs that support. Uh, but he is, he is missed when he's not here. That, that's for sure. Uh, I looked at the announcements that they have, but the only thing that they had there on the printing was that uh, uh, Chuck is going to share with that, the announcement thing. But I do want to say a few things uh, for you so that you will know how things are going to function the next couple weeks at least. And that is uh, the pastor and our head of Elder is both away, uh, so I will be filling in a little bit for um, the head elder. And so if you have any questions, just feel free to give me a call, but please call on my wife's telephone, not on mine, because I hate telephones. <clears throat> But we will uh, get through this during this particular Sabbath programs. And uh, we will move along. And sometimes we say we get, oh, we need to, we need to have a long-winded speaker. Or we get out early sometimes. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to do anything there in regards to whether... Chuck is going to be long-winded or, or not. Uh, <laughs> we'll find out. Is right. But, you know, uh, I didn't know last week when I uh, left here who was speaking. And I dealt with it a little bit during the week. And I felt that I needed to call Bill because he was scheduled to be up here. And I didn't know who was speaking, and I'd like to know who was speaking. And he told me that Chuck was speaking. And I thought, you know, that's because I remembered a couple weeks ago, our pastor said to us that Chuck was the best person to represent us as a message giver for this particular weekend. And uh, I would say, yes, he is. But unfortunately, I have been not blessed, that's for sure. But I get, on an average, about the, for the last two months, I've been getting probably 30 or 40 letters every week from the government. Uh, not that I'm a politician, and I don't want it either but God will bless us this day as we worship him as we go and I think I'll just say that our opening hymn is, is going to be 647 let us all stand and open our books to 647 Thank you. 
and we knew it were possible for the morning prayer. Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to come to your house on this Sabbath day. We come with love in our hearts. We come to hear your word. We come to fellowship with each other. Amen. And Father, we're just so thankful that you are our living God. We're so thankful that you provide for us. We're so thankful for your word that you inspired to be written down in our Bibles, that we can come to them each day and we can read about what your plan was for us. We're so thankful that we have an intercessory that we can deliver our petitions to each day. And Father, some of us have problems when we pray, but we know that Jesus will straighten them out. Make them say the things that is coming from our hearts. and help us deliver what our concerns are. And Father, we're so thankful that your Holy Spirit is amongst us all the time. And Father, we're so thankful that that Holy Spirit provides us with the strength and the knowledge to do the things that we do in our daily lives. And Father, we ask that you be with those who are sick. We ask that you be with those who've lost loved ones. We ask you, Father, to be with those who are living in countries that are torn in turmoil. They don't know where they're going to sleep. They don't know when the next bomb is going to fall. Father, the persecution in this world is grand. There's a lot of it. Father, we need your comfort. We need to feel your love that you have for us. And Father, we ask that you give healing to those that would be your will. We ask that you allow all of us to feel the warmth of your love. And Father, we pray that as we go out, we will become a witness to you. We know that as we crack the doors on our house and we walk out the door, there's a possibility and more, probably more probability that each one of us has become a witness. And Father, we pray that our actions will be acceptable in your sight as we witness for you. And we pray, Father, for the opportunities that we may have to explain to others about Jesus Christ. It may not be an organized meeting that we would have. It may be just a casual acquaintance. It may just be a smile it may just be a handshake. But Father, we pray that we have that opportunity to tell them about your love. And Father, all the things that we accomplish in this world, we give all the glory to you. Amen. Because without you, we are nothing. Amen. Again, I say good morning.
we're offering today is for the local church budget. And I want to share with you what is written here, taken from Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And we have, as a Seventh-day Adventist, have been saying that for many a year. And it appears to me that it is getting closer and closer each and every day. It says, we worship with tithes and offerings because we wait eagerly to see our God face to face. Scripture associates the second coming with the proclamation of the gospel to the whole world. Matthew 24, 14. He desires everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. Our involvement in doing and supporting God's mission makes it possible for others to hear and receive the good news. And Peter describes the waiting experience as an active one. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Ellen G. White clarifies Peter's words by giving the gospel to the world. It is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for what, but to hasten the coming of the day. It appears that God has given us the possibility to hasten its coming also. The example of a sled helps us to understand the meaning of a hastening Christ's return. If you put a sled at the top of the hill and allow it to glide, it will reach the bottom after some time. This is a natural course due to gravity and normal force. However, kids who like playing in the snow know that you can speed up your sled as it goes downhill. Among other tricks, you can spray cooking oil on the bottom of the sled, pack down the snow on the track, stay low on the sled, or balance your weight on the sled. As a result, you go faster, and it is more fun. And in the same way, the reality of the second coming is unalterable. It will take place, but it can happen earlier if we associate with Jesus and reach out to others. Are we going to forsake this opportunity to speed up his coming? This week as we worship with our tithe and our regular offerings, we can reveal how much we are wishing for the second coming. Lord, as, we, as a friendly God, you don't want to be separated from your children any longer. So please help us to demonstrate the same desire through our actions and giving. And uh, so, you know, when we look at it that way, uh, we can hasten and we can share just as much as we care to share, so to speak, uh, with others. And church is not, church is a good place to share the love of God. But the workplace, I wouldn't say is a better place, but it's an attractive place. And uh, I'm known, unfortunately, I guess, is he's the preacher man at work. And if they have a question, and they, a lot of them have questions, and they hear the Seventh-day Adventist message rather than some of the other messages when they, when they ask for my uh, concerns and so forth. And this is what we need to do, is share the Lord with others. Shall we bow our heads as the deacons come forward? Heavenly Father, we thank you ever so much for what you do for us each and every day. And as we are here now to prepare to give to you some of what you have given to us. Take it and bless it, dear Lord, with others, is our prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of that word.
You know, this gentleman's one of the workhorses in this church. His whole family is. And it's just a pleasure for me to be able to come up here this morning and pray for him as he gets ready to deliver our message. I can't think of anybody that would be more qualified. And uh, I ask you to join with me as we pray for Chuck. Father, we ask that you be with Chuck this morning. Give him the words that you'd have him to say and let him enter our hearts with what he has to say and let your words reach us in a way that we will understand what God means to our country. And Father, this man knows more about our country and history than anyone that I know. And I ask that you be with him and give him the strength and energy to deliver the message that you would have him to deliver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Just remember, flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> That's hard to live up to everything that he said. <laughs> um, first of all, a, a little bit of housekeeping, I guess. Uh, I got to clear the air. I promised Rhonda I would say something nice about her. So let's see. Don't bite off more than you can chew. No, really. Uh, Rhonda and I have kind of a thing going, and, and uh, um, you all need to know, if you don't know, that Rhonda's behind the scenes doing stuff all the time. She's, she's um, you know, deals with the conference, and believe me, you don't want me in that picture. She deals with the conference. She deals with a lot of the issues around the church. She heads up that um, prayer group on Wednesday evenings, and, um, uh, and she has to put up with Danny and, and me. And... Um, but what, you really, what I really want you to know is that on four occasions recently, she stuck her head in the booth there and said, I was on the schedule to stand there. I don't, I don't lead song service. I just stand there and make noise. She said, would you like me to take over song service for you? I said, yes, please do. Please do. So on four occasions at least, she has spared you all the misery of having me stand at that, at that lectern there. So anyhow. Um, isn't this a neat verse on, the, uh, on this uh, bulletin? Rain down my godliness, you heavens above. Let freedom spring to life. Let godliness grow richly along with it. I have created all these things. I am the Lord. You know, in all the times I've gotten up here, I've never found that verse to, to support some of the things I'm saying. And the reason is, I'm afraid, it's from the NIRV, which is the New International Reader's Version. And if you look at all the translations of that verse, the word freedom never appears in it. And um, I can't say that's not true, but that's, that's not what's in all the other versions. But it is a, it is a text that kind of sticks with you. Um, one of the reasons I have such a difficult time put, uh, picking meaningful scripture to go with what I want to say is because one of my favorite topics you won't find in the Bible anywhere. But the Bible itself is laced with it through and through. And, and that's the concept of what's called natural law. And natural law is a system of law based upon a close observation of human nature and based on values intrinsic to human nature that can be de deduced and applied independently of positive law. According to natural law theory, all people have inherent rights conferred, of them, conferred upon them not by an act of legislation but by God. And, and that, that, that is very important. I like to call it God's order of the universe because it's the way everything operates, natural law. Um, it's valid and irrevocable across all times, all places, all people, and all creation. Um, it's self-evident, and that's where that uh, scripture came from, verse, uh, Romans 1.20. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without reason. Excuse, excuse me, without excuse. 
Sorry, I didn't print this big enough. If human beings do not work out the basic nature of God from what is seen in creation and seek him from there, they are simply without excuse. They are willfully ignoring the obvious. God insists that he has made it plain to human reasoning uh, and that to decide otherwise is to suppress the truth that we know by nature. Part of the natural law is, of course, unalienable rights. As I mentioned earlier, there are rights that, that are given by God, not by government. They're irrevocable and not transferable. And if you mess with natural law, the outcome is usually going to be pretty ugly. Just to give you an example, you know, one of the physical attributes of nature's law is gravity, right? I don't know whether any of you remember a show on TV in the 60s called Ripcord. Ripcord was two guys in a Cessna airplane, and they went around rescuing damsels in distress and putting out fires and catching bad men. And they did that by parachuting out of their airplane and, you know, did their thing. Well, I know a child that decided he wanted to be a Ripcord star, and he got two pieces of bale and twine tucked under his arm, tied it onto a feed sack, and jumped off a swing set. Now, I don't know what's so funny. I mean, I was, I was only 23 years old when I did that. But, so, so you know, there, there you go. I, I only did it once. I only did it once. And I really didn't suffer any injury that I know of. But anyhow. Yeah. But given all that, you know, 246 years ago on Monday, the most benevolent and prosperous society the world's ever known was chartered in the Declaration of Independence. And that Declaration of Independence is built entirely around the concept of natural law. And the first 141 words are in, are in your bulletin, if you care to go with me there. Um, we're going to go through it real quick. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, they were saying, we're not playing nice with England anymore, and, we, and the world deserves to know why we're not playing nice with England anymore. But more importantly, right there, they invoke the laws of nature and of nature's God. And people say that we're not a biblical nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident means... Um, Knowable by all. It's not hidden by a person's ability to, comp to comprehend. It is self-evident. It's common knowledge by simple observation and experience. And that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator. So there is a second time in the first, hundred first breath of our existence that God is invoked in our charter. With certain unalienable rights, you know, you hear me talk about that a lot, same old thing, non-transferable, irrevocable, apply to all people at all times and all places. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, a lot of people say, well, what's government supposed to do? Well, I don't know what everybody else's government is supposed to do, but our government's supposed to secure our rights. They're not, government's not there to protect us. It's not there to take care of us. It's not there to give us things. It's there to protect, to secure our rights. And that is what has created the miracle that we call America. Now, when you think about that, Romans 13, 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. This verse has always troubled me, because virtually all governments, at least until now, have ended up ending in bloodshed, violence, and destruction, every one of them. So how can that buy, be from God? It's something that, that I would like for us to take on as a study sometime. Now, I don't even know which version I took that out of, um, but the King James Version says it differently. They say, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, not government, to the higher powers. So where do you draw the line there? I don't know. That's for y'all to tell me and think about. Going back to unalienable rights, 
It's a subset of natural law, again, endowed by God, not by government, unalterable, irrevocable. I'll stop, try to stop saying that, but I can't emphasize it enough. One key thing about un, unalienable rights is that to exercise those rights requires not the talent, labor, or resources of another. You don't need somebody, you need a doctor to come stitch up your wounds. Well, that's, that's not a right. That's just a privilege. Um, and the other thing about unalienable rights is they end where they begin impeding on the rights of another. Uh, and of course, among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And really, life is one and liberty is the other, and everything else fits into liberty. Because if you think about all these rights we have, they are all part of being um, at liberty. Um, some of them, you have a right and an obligation to provide for yourself uh, and not to be taken care of by another. You have a right and obligation to nurture your young, not, not let somebody else do it for you or not make somebody else do it for you. In fact, um, John Locke, who was very influential on our founding fathers, has a statement that, that I just love. He says, the nurturing and education of children is so incumbent upon the parents that nothing can relieve them of that uh, obligation. And look at us today. We got, what, 75% of kids living in broken households, a divorce rate's 50%. How many unwedded uh, uh, births occur every year? It's horrible. You have a right to learn, but you don't have a right to be taught. You have a right and have obligation to defend yourself, your property, and others. And this is probably the most obvious because um, if you're threatened, you're going to defend yourself, no matter what stupid law might be on the books trying to prevent you from doing so. You have a right to prosper. It's not a guarantee. You have a right to try. You have a right to pursue happiness, but you're not entitled to it. And most important, I guess, is you have a right to worship. And that's probably the purest form of our unalienable rights, because you can worship God anywhere you want to, anytime you want to, in silence or verbally, with absolutely no input from another. You can do it in jail, you can do it while you're on a guillotine. So, um, and that's one of the purest forms, but it's, it's constantly under attack. And then you have a right to conduct commerce, to, to buy, sell, and trade with another. But, but wait a minute, so I just said that it requires not the talents of another, right? So how does commerce fit in there? Well, commerce fits in there because there's another one that I've never spoken about much. There's another right that, that I've just not covered in any time I've been in front of you. And that is the right or freedom of association. Um, and it simply means that a person has the right to associate not with who he chooses, but with whoever chooses to associate with him um, or willing to associate with him. Inherent in the right to associate is the right to not associate. Any person has the right not to associate with whomever he chooses. If I care not to hire a guy that's got a, a ring in his nose, um, I, have the, I think I have the right to do that. Of course, the government is constantly laying down laws telling you what you can and can't do with, with people you interact with. Freedom of association also encompasses both an individual's right to join or leave groups voluntarily, the right of a group to take collective action or pursue the interest of its members, and the right of an association to accept or decline membership based upon certain criteria. It can be described as the right of a person coming together with other individuals to collectively express, promote, or pursue a common interest. Freedom of association is both an individual right and a collective right guaranteed by all modern democratic legal systems, including the U.S. Bill of Rights. So... In Virginia, we still have a we still have a right to work, um, and it'll now that well, it'll probably stay there for a while. Um, but off in other states, and in, and an attempt in Virginia was made to force people to join unions to work for a particular employer. I that that is counterproductive to everything that that we believe is freedom loving people. Shifting gears. Big time. Um, it wasn't that long ago, certainly within the last three or four years, that I spoke, did a whole message on emotion and, uh, and reason. 
a great controversy, not the great controversy, but a great controversy. And I know every one of you remembers everything I said, so I'm only going to hit the high points. Let's look at emotion. Emotion is a natural instinctive state deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationship with others as, distinguishing, as distinguished from reasoning or knowledge. Now, somebody said there's 271 emotions, and I, I kind of went through them, and the ones I saw before I fell asleep, I agreed, were probably good, valid emotions. Um, but believe it or not, there's currently no scientific consensus of a definition for emotion. And I find that interesting, because, you know, you can go to a search engine and type, uh, what, give me the definition of, and just, and it's going to come up with something for that, but you type in emotion, and you don't get it. There's no scientific um, consensus. Well, some emotions that affect us. Compassion. I consider compassion a good emotion because usually you're wanting, you have a feeling for something that's going on around you, you want to help out. But then again, it can be a double-edged sword. For instance, what's more compassionate? Feeding somebody or teaching them how to take care of themselves? Where, where's the compassion in and reason start? Emotion tends to invoke logical, reasonable action, but too often reason goes out the window. Um, take, for instance, love. Love is a good emotion, but uh, all too often love can change into something else. Some folks say that Eve fell in love with the fruit and allowed emotion to overpower reason. And, um, you know, love is good until it turns into lust. And... Lust is an intent, an intent desire for something. Um, to lust for something good is probably good. To lust for something that's wrong is probably bad. Um, and how, think about how much pain and suffering have been inflicted upon society by love and lust. Then we get to some others. Greed. Greed is an emotion. Well, what is greed? Well... I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't look up a um, definition, but I'll tell you this. A desire to prosper is not greed. Because generally somebody that desires to prosper also wants people, others to prosper with them. Um, I would consider taking from one and giving to another under force of law is greed. I would consider um, attempting to lower everybody to the lowest common denominator so we all feel equal is also a form of greed. How about pride? It's probably good to be proud of your church, your family, or whatever. You're proud of yourself, you might become a little arrogant. And then there's anger and hate, and you know, they have their own pluses and minuses. But there's one that's necessary, in fact, it's built into us, it's built into all of God's creation, that's fear. Fear is the most powerful emotion of all, and it, it is in everything that God has created that's alive, and it invokes an unalienable right, which is also in everything that God's created, and that's self-defense. Again, if you're threatened, uh, you're going to defend yourself. It might be running away, it might be crawling under a, um, a, a pew, or it might be fighting back. But there are, as you know, there, there's a lot of laws on the books in this country and others too that Tell you how you can behave when you're trying to defend yourself. Emotion tends to absorb information that supports emotion rather than consider conflicting information. Look at everything that we see out there and how it's hyperbolized and, you know, it's designed to pull on those emotional strings and cast uh, um, reason out the window. I would say that emotion is Satan's preferred tool to get things done. And the next thing right behind it is media. If you think, if you look at how media sensationalizes everything based upon what they want to accomplish, um, it's a tragedy. And so many people just absorb the media and run with it. Um, I read some research that, as an example, a Google search, 60% of the Google searches that are done never result in a click. What it results in is a list that Google throws out in front of you, and somewhere in that list is the answer that you're looking for, and that's all, that's all you need to know. 
That's why you see people doing this all the time. They're not really doing research. They're just looking at headlines and search suggestions. And uh, when you've got a society that absorbs information like that, um, it can only get worse. What can I say? How do, how do I explain that? Joseph Goebbels was um, Adolf Hitler's right-hand man. In fact, after Hitler committed suicide, he appointed Goebbels to take his place. Goebbels was in the position for one day, and then he gave his family cyanide, and the next day he gave himself cyanide. So <laughs> he was the minister of propaganda for Hitler. He's got an important quote here. There is no point in seeking to convert the intellectuals, for intellectuals would never be converted and would always yield to the stronger, and this will always be the man in the street. Arguments must therefore be crude, clear, and forcible, and appeal to the emotions and instincts, not the intellect. Truth was unimportant and entirely subordinate to tactics and psychology. In other words, appeal to the emotion to get your point across, avoid reason and logic. So then that brings us to reason. It's the capacity of consciously applying logic by drawing conclusions from new or existing information with the aim of seeking the truth. How about that? So let's seek the truth. Cicero, who was a Greek or Roman, Roman, Roman emperor, said he called it the divine gift of reason because it was given to people. It wasn't given to any of the rest of God's creation. Uh, humans are the only ones that can use reason to make decisions. All the, all the other creation pretty much reacts on just emotion. Proverbs 29, 11 says it all perfectly. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And if you look at advertising campaigns and political campaigns and marketing campaigns, what do you see? You see it appealing to emotion because they know that in, a, in any contest, emotion is usually going to win almost all the time. So I've talked about several different things, and none of them are related. I hope you all can follow me because I didn't. I can't follow myself. I want to look at a few couple. Um, recent current events. As you know, the Supreme Court um, passed a ruling on um, abortion. Basically saying, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but basically it's up to the states. Let me back up a little bit. They passed a ruling legalizing, uh, or not legalizing, abortion's already been never mind. What happened? They passed a ruling. On one side there was this huge outcry Oh, my God, abortion has been banned. Right to choose has been banned. Women's health has been banned. We're all going to die, and democracy's going to fail. And then on the other side, there's hooray, a victory for life, a victory for life. Not so fast. What it did was it returned the decision back to the states. So instead of the federal government saying that abortion is legal and you can kill your children, it's up to the states to decide if you can kill your children. Now, I don't, I mean, yes, it's an improvement, but I'll tell you what. Um, every state and most localities have rules on their books that afford salamanders or gnats or ticks more protection than children. When you can kill an unborn child and perfectly legally, and then um, get put in jail or fined for killing a duck or running over a duck egg with your lawnmower. You know, where in the world is the reason for, for, you know, that supports that? It just doesn't. Um, and also, you know, here's a good one. Y'all may remember the case of Lacey and Scott Peterson back in the early 2000s in California. It turned into a, kind of a celebrity event. Uh, Lacey, who was pregnant, disappeared. She was found sometime later, and of course her unborn child was dead also. 
Eventually, they convicted her husband, Scott Peterson, of a double murder. It was the first double murder conviction based upon the death of a fetus. So <laughs> here the guy got put in jail for killing a fetus, yet the doctor down the road can kill him all day long. There's something wrong with that picture. I ran across a quote from Jonah Goldberg, and I think this might be one of the best things I found in this whole presentation. Uh, and I don't follow Jonah, Go don't, Jonah Goldberg. I'm not even sure I remember who he is, but here's what he had to say. We as a culture lost something valuable when we lost faith in the existence of Satan. Having serious conception of evil and temptations of evil that Satan manifests is an important part of understanding the good. Reasonable people can disagree on the conception of the good. But reasonable people should also be able to agree on at least some things that are evil without recourse or explanation. Murdering children is one of those things. Murdering children is evil because it is evil. There's another one of those self-evident things, nasty self-evident things popping up there. If you have to explain that, you've already lost an important part of the battle. So the abortion thing's not over, and if you look at the vitriol on the left that's being directed to those that believe in life, um, it's, it's going to get ugly again. There is a massive um, effort to have Clarence Thomas impeached. I don't think it will succeed. He really wasn't the driving force in the decision. Uh, Sam Alito, I think, wrote the decision. Uh, but it's going to get, it's going to come back to, to haunt us again. The Supreme Court also ruled that sectarian schools could not be denied assistance given non-sectarian schools. And I think this is a case in Maine. Oh, my God, it's the end of public school. Oh, we can't have that. By the way, all schools are public. I need to change that to government schools. But, oh, my God, it's the end of, end of public schools. And then the other side saying, hooray, school choice, finally, school choice. And the reason says, well, you know, do we really want that? Do we really want the government funding anything in private schools, especially religious ones? Because I'll tell you what, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And the government doesn't give anybody money without strings attached. In writing his opinion, uh, there was a similar case, and this, is, this was news to me, I didn't know this. Uh, Chief Justice quoted a case in Montana several years ago, and he explained that the state need not subsidize private education, but if it decides to do so, it cannot disqualify private schools because they're religious. Can't do it. And he went on to say, um, well, no, he didn't say this, it was in the article. Since the 1980s, the Supreme Court has recognized, based on the history of the First Amendment, that the Establishment Clause does not ban citizens' religious expression on public property or in publicly funded programs. So this brings us to the football coach. If you all familiar with that case that just came out, I forget, he was Kansas or Colorado, I can't remember which. Um, don't know the whole story. Well, I did, but I don't remember it all. He was having a corporate prayer with his team and got in trouble for that. And then he, he did some various other things that, that he kept on getting in trouble with. So finally, at the end of the games, he would, by himself, would go out on the 50-yard line and kneel for prayer. Didn't invite anybody to be with him. Didn't tell anybody uh, that he had to be there. He just went out there and did it himself. And over time, he had a following that would join him, a major following. Well, he got fired. And um, the Supreme Court recently awarded him his job back if he wanted it. And I'm not sure I'd want to go back to work for somebody that did that. Um, but, um, again, a motion. Oh, my God, prayer in schools, not again. Well, it's not prayer in schools. And then the other side saying, hooray, prayer in schools. I have a friend. Kathy knows him. Um, he's kind of one of these guys that's very emotional. And he's going all over talking about prayer in schools, prayer in schools, finally prayer back in schools. Well, it's not. Uh, and, and it's a far cry from it because a, a football coach and, and people of the free will congregating on a 50-yard line of a public football game 
is a whole lot different than having children in a classroom where they're forced to endure, if, for lack of a better word, a prayer that's sponsored by anybody in the, um, in the, in the, in the classroom. So, and do we really want prayer in public schools? That's always been a question of mine. Whose prayer are we going to use? I mean, is it... When I was in school, our parents ran the school, and there was very little influence from the state or federal governments. Well, that's, that's a far cry from where it is today. Um, in fact, like in our county, our school system is half of our budget, and just about all of that comes from the state government. So, and of course, when the state government gives you that much money, they're going to tell you how to spend it. So, eh, we need to think about that one. But then... Danny asked me a while back if I wanted to talk. I said, no, nah, I'm done. I just talk about the same old thing every time, and people are tired of it. But an event happened a few weeks ago that prompted me to talk about it, and everybody that's been in this pulpit since it happened have mentioned it. And that's the Uvalde massacre, the Uvalde killing. Um, and, and I can't talk about that without talking about nickel mines. Um, nickel, if you remember Nickel Mines, this was in 2006, a, in an Amish community up in Pennsylvania. A, if you're not Amish, you're English. If you're not English, you're Amish. So that's how it works up there. And, and it's fine. Everybody's cool with it. So an English truck driver who, who drove tankers picking up milk from the dairy farms, for whatever reason, uh, blockaded a little... Mennonite or Amish school that at that time was had a, a classroom of girls in there and ended up 10 of those little girls died and and the shooter did too at the same time the trial for this Peterson guy was going on in California and so I was just floored because the parents of the young lady that lost her life and her um, and their and their grandchild we're on TV saying, you know, death is too good for this guy. You know, string him up and stretch him out and pull him apart. And, you know, there's, there's no death that's, that's proper for, for um, Scott Peterson. But then in Nickel Mines, the first thing that happened, and I think it was the next day, the elders of the Amish church went to the shooter's house. He, the shooter died in the, in the event. And his, his wife and kids were there. And they had prayer, a prayer of forgiveness with that family. Whew. That's, that's really impressive. I mean, to, to be able to go through that and immediately band together, take your buggies over to this house and offer prayer to that family. Anyhow, so Uvalde. Um, I read this somewhere. I want to relay it to you. Uh, as a school principal, so he was asked, what are we missing? What do children need? And they went on about mental illness and the juvenile system and the gun control and education reform and that whole stuff. And there's some blame to be laid there. But here's what this guy says they need. Children need a mother and father who love each other and work together as a team. They need a bicycle, neighbors, and cousins. I mean, when I was a kid, you couldn't, you couldn't find anybody to go look for the pile of bicycles. That's where everybody was. They need a grandma to bake with and a grandpa to take them fishing. Well, we, we certainly have a grandma that can bake. I don't know about the fishing part. Children need a church, Sunday school class, and a truth-telling preacher. Now, last weekend, we were in Wake Forest with our daughter's family, and uh, Wake Forest is the home of the Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And during our drive through there to get to, to different places we were going, I was just floored by the gay pride flags that were out in front of the churches, uh, embracing these lifestyles that are unbiblical. Children need a dinner time with home-cooked food, prayer, and conversation. They need Sunday afternoon football and fried chicken. They need books on tape and coloring pages. I saw a little video somewhere, social media probably. This guy was on a subway, and he was panning around with his camera, and you know, everybody just... Mm. And he got over here to this one guy of, of modest means, I'd have to say. He was of modest means, and he had three kids right next to him. All four of them had a hardback book that they were, they were engrossed in. And the guy stopped and, you know, filmed them for a little bit and then moved on over to the other guys that were, you know, doing this. 
We need more of that, more of that. Um, children need summers at the beach and bazooka bubblegum. Children need a trip to Arlington and Fourth of July fireworks. Children need fire pits, some more ghost stories, the drive-in and popcorn, real popcorn. They need discipline from their parents. They need chores, a job, a way to earn what they want. Now think about it. Is Johnny going to take better care of his dad's sports car or is he going to take better care of the beater that he bought with his own money? He's going to take better care of that beater with his own money. Children need an education that recognizes mom and daddy as the authority, God as the creator, and the Bible as a roadmap. When you remove God from everything, the thief that steals, kills, and destroys moves in. So anyhow, the, in the aftermath of the Uvalde tragedy, uh, you've seen it, I'm sure. Uh, oh my God, we've got to repeal the Second Amendment and take away everybody's guns. We can't lose any more children like that. When you, really, when you look, start looking at the gun statistics, and I'm not going to belittle what happened out there, but um, there's more, there's infinite, no, not infinitely, there's way more people killed from uh, guns, fire, and violence every, you know, around the country uh, as compared to this tragedy. In fact, one of, the, one of the stats that's being thrown around is that we are way up here in the number, the United States is way up here in the number of gun deaths. Well, we are, but you know what? If you start digging through the numbers and you take out, as I recall, don't hold me to it, if you take out Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, that puts us down in the bottom 5% of gun violence in the world. Okay, so now, here's what I got written here. Off script, you're on your own, wing it. Because I couldn't, I couldn't spend too much more time trying to decide how to write this out. But let's look at what happened in Uvalde. And um, it's probably, a lot of it is probably indicative of things that have happened in other tragedies like that. This fellow was evidently um, unhinged. You know, he had the big red flags flying that, hey, I'm, I need help, I'm dangerous, etc. Okay. So, first thing you got to ask is, how did he get all that stuff? How did he get those weapons? How did he get that ammunition? How did he learn how to do all that? How did he learn how to fire it? How did he get there? He didn't have a driver's license. How did he get the, the uh, weapons without a driver's license? I understand he bought them from, from a gun store. Well, let's think about this a minute. And this, uh, I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm saying this, is, this could have very well happened, and it certainly happened elsewhere. He goes into the gun store, and there's the poor schmuck back there, you know, selling guns. And the guy walks up, and the, and the, the uh, gun store clerk looks at him and says, this guy's trouble. I can't sell him a gun. He's going to kill somebody, and then it'll be on me. That's what he's thinking to himself. But then the government has put together a list of check boxes you check, and if you check those boxes, you've got to sell him the gun. You've got to sell him the gun. So what does the guy do? Does he risk a discrimination lawsuit or does he give the guy the gun think about it this is where the association comes in I, to give you an example i would say that one thing that might stop some of these things because it seems like a lot of this happens right after somebody visits a gun store is to relieve the gun stores of liability for refusing to sell a gun as it is right now they have these guidelines they got to go by to sell a gun and if they if all the boxes are checked the trade happens so this association thing is a big deal. There's laws all over the country that, that, that force you to accept behaviors you don't agree with. It's one thing, you know, if, you, if a guy wants to wear a dress, fine, whatever. Just don't force me to validate it. And, and if, I, if I don't want to associate with you, then that's my right. And until we realize these kinds of things and start acting like responsible adults, uh, we're going to have more of the same, I'm afraid. And the government's not going to be there to help us. They're going to be on the other side. It, it really is. Um, Satan knows what he's got going. Divide and conquer. And everything that we see happening to us today is to divide and conquer. And you can see the chasm growing between, 
I'll say the left and the right. And um, I can't decide whether we're at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning of this war that we're in. So, um, those words that everybody's looking for. Right, Beth? In closing, <laughs> in closing, I'm going to leave you with a few things. We must understand that some things are evil because they are, no matter what kind of spin Satan puts on it. Understand that Satan seeks to divide and conquer. Seek truth in all affairs, whether it's scripture or whatever's going on in the secular world. Step back from emotion and let reason enter into some of the things that you do and the activities that you participate in. And remember, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And I'm going to close with two quotes you've heard. Well, one up. No, you haven't heard the second one because that's brand new. From Abraham Lincoln in the, in the heat of the Civil War in his uh, State of the Union address, 1862. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down, in honor or dishonor, to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows that we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just. A way which, if followed, the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. And then the second quote, Kathy handed this to me the, just the other day. This, ben Carson has started an organization called um, American Cornerstone Institute. And this was, listed, this was sent to um, Kathy as a free book. It's not really a book, but it's, it's very informative. It's breaking down the Declaration of Independence. And go to the American Cornerstone Institute, and you can probably find this. For what it's worth, Ben Carson is also heavily involved in a veterans organization up here on Route 29. Uh, he's there quite frequently. I, I don't know. Well, good for him. And he closes this with this statement. Remember, we're in a war. Don't forget that. Just like the early days of our nation, we are living in challenging times, but it's always darkest before dawn, and everything good in life goes through some sort of turmoil. That's the nature of being a human being in society. But we have to know what our principles are. We have to know the foundations that made us into a great nation. And we have to be willing to advocate and fight for those things. We cannot sit quietly <clears throat> because that's when evil succeeds. Instead, we must be willing to stand for the principles that are given to us by our Judeo-Christian faith to truly love one another. If we do, not only will America benefit, but so will the whole world. Ben Carson. And then finally... I think the last time I spoke was July 3rd of 2021. And I read this prayer in closing. I'm going to read it again because, you know what? It worked. And when I get finished with it, you'll see why. Please bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the, <clears throat> for the great sleeping giant, the church, who even now has begun to shake herself from sleep. I pray she would awake to righteousness and holiness in every denomination, in every body of believers, and slumber no longer. I pray that we would begin to unify under the blood-stained banner of the cross and preach the gospel of the kingdom clearly and boldly in every highway and byway of our nation. I pray that we will not only stand up and speak up, but that we will begin to reap a great harvest in our nation, bringing multitudes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. May the revival be so all-encompassing that it affects the spiritual complexion of our entire nation and influences our politics, our economy, our media, and our entire society. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you know, we've got, we've got an awakening. It's happening now, and we can be a part of it. Song leader. Please open your hymn books to page 612 and please stand.
powerful message. Thank you. And a warning, both in delight and a wake-up call. You know, what you said about emotions, what you said about we should think and use our reasoning, is something that's so important in our world today. But I want you to remember, in whatever decisions you make, whatever emotions befall you, remember, the devil is decisive. Think long and hard, and most of all, keep God in front in whatever you do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that we've heard. We ask that you implant upon our hearts the words that you've heard and in our minds and in our thoughts that we think and associate with your word and your plan for us and that you guide and direct us in all we do as we leave this place today. May the Holy Spirit guide and direct us and our actions be those that are acceptable within your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us look at the back of our handbook for our closing song for the closing of the service. Thank you.